Good morning. Welcome to South Lake Wales Church of God. We're so glad you're here this morning joining us in a time of worship. We understand things are not like they usually are, but that's okay. We've asked the Lord to be here and join us, and we're going to celebrate our risen Savior this day. So join with me as we sing, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Stand amazed 
South Lake Wells Church of God family, thank you for joining us today. At this moment, we want to stop and we want to calm our spirits and we want to pray for two specific people groups. One is our healthcare workers and two, those who own businesses here in Polk County. If you take a moment and just be silent with me and then I'll pray. My most gracious heavenly Father, creator of all good things, we stop, we calm ourselves, and we look to you for answers. Father, we know that we are not in control. We know that you are the one who is in complete control. And so, Father, right now, those of us who are holding on to that control so tightly, Father, I pray that we just open our hands and we surrender to you right now. Father, I want to pray for the health care workers and those who are on the front line who are putting their own lives at risk to save other people. And Father, we know that this isn't anything new, that they do this every day. But Father, specifically right now, we know that they don't have any idea what they're walking into each and every day. Father, I pray from the top of their head to the bottoms of their feet that you place a hedge of protection around them, that you keep them safe, you keep them well. And Father, at night when they go home to their families or to their roommates, or to their parents. Father, we pray right now that you protect the people and those households as well. Father, we know that corona isn't from you. We know that COVID-19 isn't from you. 
But Father, we do know that you're going to use this for your glory. And so, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we pray for protection. And Father, we want to pray for the businesses around Polk County that are struggling, that might have to, to lay off people or, or even close their doors, Father. And we pray in the name of Jesus, knowing that you already have a plan for them. But Father, I pray for endurance during this time. I pray for peace. I pray for stillness. Father, we don't know what tomorrow brings, but we know who holds tomorrow. And so, Father, right now, let us surrender all of that to you. And I pray all of this in Jesus' precious, holy, and divine name. Amen.
These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that, your, that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Since, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you, you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. I say good morning to everybody. No matter where you're joining us from, I know we've kind of scattered all over the, the community, the county, and now even the country, and we're so glad that you're here with us today. Tell me, have you heard this phrase before? When the cat's away, the mice will play. Uh, a, a few months ago, actually it's been several months ago now, my three ladies left me for a weekend, um, they went over and spent some time with Liz's family, and that meant I was home alone. Uh, it, was, it was fabulous. I, I don't get that opportunity many times. And so what I did is I came and I sat down right here on the couch. I grabbed my cell phone. I ordered a pizza. I had my potato chips. I had my Coke Zero in my hand. Uh, I, I had candy. I had popcorn I, for for a whole weekend, I looked at the TV, I had my goodies, I was in heaven. I focused my attention and there I was, dishes piling up, trash overflowing. I was worshiping at the altar of comfort and convenience, consumerism, celebrity glorification. While the cat's away, the mice will play. Do you know what happened when I got the text message that they were on the way home? I kicked my hyperdrive in. Uh, it, I just I was cleaning up everything. I was taking out the trash. I was I was wiping down the counters. I was vacuuming the crumbs uh, because when I thought that the the cat was away. When I, I thought that um, nobody knew what was going on in me, I worshiped at the idol of my own convenience. It is an unbelievable thing how we do that. You know what? I think that is an illustration of the human heart. I think that's a picture of how we are. Last week, I, I shared a quote with you from um, Tim Keller's book, um, Counterfeit Gods. He says this, the human heart is an idol factory. I think that our homes have become idol factories. Do you think, now hang in there with me for a minute. 
Do you think it's possible that we're missing the point of exile 2020? Do you think that there is any chance whatsoever that, that you're missing the point of why God would have allow a stay at home order to be put in place? I don't know uh, about you, but I'm, I'm tired of being at home. I don't do good at being home and I'm out more than most. I know that many of you are anxious to get back to things as normal, church as normal. We, we struggle with this, but do you think there's any chance we're missing God's voice in this stay at home order? Um, I, I have this, I don't know, I'm gonna call it this Holy Spirit prompting that maybe God is allowing that the Holy Spirit is giving us time to evaluate our priorities in the home of what's important in the, inside the four walls of our house. Um, you know, in this moment when worship has moved from our sanctuaries, um, from the place uh, that we're comfortable worshiping, where, where we've moved from the time of gathering with brothers and sisters to being just with our family, where our forms and, and our structures for order of worship are, are different. Um, I, I think each one of us is struggling because it doesn't feel the same. I get that. I really get that. But what might God be speaking and whispering into your life, into your family, into your home about worship being in the center of your home. Uh, during our worship time last week, we gather here on this couch and I streamed the, the, the live service to our TV and here we gather, my family, my girls. I was sitting here and I noticed something an, an internal revelation and awareness struck me that the posture of my heart wasn't worshiping because this isn't where we worship. This isn't worship. Uh, and as I was sitting here becoming greatly aware of my temperature rising, I looked at my girls and I saw them reflecting my posture of worship home isn't where I worship. I worship at church. Uh, the inclination in most of us initially is to see it in others and not ourselves. And so I immediately began to say, girls, it's time to worship. Let's sit up tall. Let's get ready to work. I wanted to blame them. I, I had moments, the same moments you have, where I wanted to blame the church for not gathering. I want to say, Pastor Cal, my kids don't know how to worship. This is your fault. But then I had to take a big step back and to recognize something. The fact that we don't know how to worship in my house is nobody's fault but mine. The fact that Jesus isn't the center of the house isn't anybody else's fault, it's mine. I think that God may be wanting to speak to us in this time I, I think it is difficult. I have to admit that as we gather around our TVs, our tablets, our smartphones to gather for worship, it's really different. And, and it's really weird to, to assume the posture that we do when we're watching on our tablet, our computer, or our TV, where we're, we're looking at this idol. These can become idols that, that has made me passive and scrolling mindlessly, everything's half-hearted, please entertain me, this better be funny, or I'm, I'm clicking off of this, and maybe I'll come back later, but I'm clicking off right now. This, hey, this is where I find my, my pleasure, the where I get my dopamine dump in my brain. Inform me, tell me what's going on about everything. It's really hard to come to God to worship around these devices, I have to admit, but you know what I think? I think that the evil one is whispering into our, our minds, into our homes, in spiritual warfare. He's, he's, he's coming and he's saying, yeah, this isn't worship. You can't worship in your home. That's not the center of worship. I'm here to tell you the home is the center of worship. Number one, I believe this, what God wants to teach us in and shut down about 
home life resurrected is the home is to be the center of our worship. Home is supposed to be the place where we are constantly bringing Jesus front and center. But in our homes, we have so many idols, so many things. You took pictures and you shared ideas this week on social media with me about the different idols in your homes, the things that distract you and they begin to move God off into the periphery, out of the camera frame of what you can see. But God wants to come front and center and be right here. And worship begins in our home as we begin to make Jesus the center of everything we do. Move God to the center. I think that God wants to reveal in our lives the idols that have slipped in. Uh, honestly, for most of us, unintentionally become what our life revolves around. Um, I know there's been po uh, points in my life where it revolved around sports and entertainment, around people or relationships, around comfort or or satisfaction and and god is saying i want to be in the center and so we have to lean into what we have been calling the easter process going to our own personal garden of gethsemane and i want to suggest that home is where that begins god not my will but your will be done there are things i don't want to get rid of i don't want to move out of the center but here they are not my will but your will be done and there are some things that God is going to say, that has to go. You, you must take that to Calvary, to the cross of Jesus, and it has to die. In obedience, you have to follow me. As we do that in our home, we will begin to experience resurrection life in our home. There will be a, a different atmosphere that is created. But this, this honestly comes down to these, these two words intentional or unintentional? Will I intentionally move God from the periphery to the center and move the things that distract me, um, the things that busy me, the, the things that, that bother me? Will I move those off to the periphery and say, I will view all of those through God? We have to identify the idols, the things that uh, we revolve our life around. Am I happy? Am I comfortable? Um, is this entertaining me enough? Is this informing me enough? Is this gratifying me enough? We center our life around these things, but God wants those things to move off into the distance. In Counterfeit Gods, Tim Keller said that gods aren't bad things. These idols that we have in our lives usually aren't bad things. They're, they're good things that we have moved into the center of our life, that we've elevated above God, that we've made more important. And so we must, in obedience, say, God, you don't want these things in the center of my life. I'm bringing you in. I'm replacing all of those things with you. So the question is, how do I, I bring God into the center and move all of these other things off into the periphery. How do I bring God in the center so that my life revolves around him? That all of these good things, things that, that may stay in your life, but they move out of center and they revolve around God. And here's what I want to suggest, that we must order our life around God, around worshiping God, to kneel before for him, to put him in the place of reverence, to recognize this truth. God is wherever you invite him in, and we want God to be invited into our home. Truth is, we know this, theologically speaking, God is everywhere. But specifically, God is where you invite him in to center your world and life around him, to order your mind and your thinking, to order your feelings uh, around what God says, to order your gut reactions and responses around what God would have us to be like. So how can I make my life revolve in worship around God? Well, um, First, you have to lead yourself. 
you have to order your life around God. As I sat here on the couch last week and we worshiped as a family and, and my blood pressure spiked because I saw my girls in a posture much like my own heart was, I was infuriated. And maybe some of you aren't like that. You Maybe it doesn't bother you, but I want my kids to know Jesus and to love the Lord more than anything, to put him in the proper place. And so I have to first lead myself I have to lead myself. These commandments I give to you today, Deuteronomy says, put them on your hearts. The, the, the starting place is for you to recognize there is one God and no other gods get to come in and be central. First command, first command that God gives, don't have any gods before me, worship me alone. And so Deuteronomy says, there is one God. There is one and only one God. Give him the respect and honor he deserves. Recognize he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. That he is here with us now and he only goes where he's invited. So we wish to invite him into our home. So lead yourself. You can't expect anybody else's posture in your home to change until your posture of worship has changed. You can't expect your spouse to change until you've changed. You can't expect your grandchildren to act differently until you're acting differently. You can't expect your parents to change if you aren't demonstrating a life of Christ-centered worship. We must lead ourselves first. In a little bit, we're going to give some practical how to when it comes to leading yourself personally. That's really the, the, the big idea of this week is how to personally order my life around Jesus. But our homes, our home life is to be resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. And though it starts with you, our families must be ordered and centralized in orbit around Jesus Christ. And, and, and therefore, we must lead those we love to worship God. Uh, so you're here today and you're saying, yeah, that's easy for you to say. You have two little girls. Uh, you don't understand. I'm single. I'm home alone. I'm watching this. I hope in my prayer for you is that you have a tribe of people that you would call your family. This applies to that tribe of people that you gather with in love. You're, you're widowed and you, you say, I'm home alone right now and you don't understand how lonely uh, that I am. I know that's probably true, but I wanna say to you, you have a family. You probably have a tribe of people that you're close to. This, this matters in that place. Families, uh, empty nest families, this applies to you. You must lead your family spiritually. And so this is what Deuteronomy 6 says. These commandments from God, uh, putting Christ first, putting God first, uh, impress them on your children. Talk to them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols around your hands and bind them around your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your houses, on, on your gates. Uh, let me give you a, my personal modern day translation. Um, number one, you cannot outsource spiritual leadership in your home. I love Pastor Cal, but you cannot expect Pastor Cal or me or our volunteers to lead your family spiritually. You must take the responsibility to impress upon your, your home how important it is to center your life around God. I, I would suggest this. A family table is the place you can sit together and in creating an order and a schedule by which to gather around the table, whether it's with your children and your family or your spouse or with your tribe of people, that you would gather around a table once a week, twice a week, and that you would talk about what God is impressing upon you. Uh, and, and, and listen, when you're in the car driving to a doctor's appointment with somebody, with your spouse, with a friend, um, you're in the car driving your kids to wherever it might be that you're going. I found this, that they're more willing to talk when you're not eyeball to eyeball 
than they are when you sit down and you talk to me right now. These are the moments to, to seize the opportunity and, and speak to them. Uh, create bedtime rituals. This doesn't matter if it's with your family or you individually. Um, when you wake up and when you go to bed, get your mind centered around the teachings of God. Get your mind centered on what God would say. Get your heart and your affections and your feelings in line with God. Get your gut reactions in line with God. Uh, then I would say, seize every teachable moment. Seize every opportunity that comes up. Well, this happens in our home every once in a while. Something comes on the TV that we didn't expect, and then suddenly we have to explain it. And we've just chosen those are teachable moments in, in our home. We're going to teach what God thinks about that in that moment, and we're not going to shy away from it. It may be uncomfortable. Half the times our kids say, I, whatever, I didn't even see that or think about that, but seize the teachable moment. And, and then finally, uh, decorate your life, decorate your home to bring you back to what's most important. Our homes become shrines to ourselves. I'm the first to look around and to recognize that. But intentionally, intentionally look for some ways that will remind you, spark you, lead you back to what's most important and teach your family what's most important. So the question is this, if we're going to get started on this, my life, my home centered around Jesus, where do I start? I know it's hard. Um, in our church, it's as hard as it is anywhere because we have people from every stage of life. We're going to attempt something today that will help with that. And stick with me for a minute and I will reveal that to you. But here's what I wanna suggest. You need to make a rule of life, what you will measure your life by for your stage of life because it's different in the different stages. Um, Pete Scazzaro, he wrote this book about emotionally healthy spirituality. And he says this, a life rule is an intentional conscious plan to keep God at the center of everything we do. He goes on to say, the starting point and foundation of any rule is a desire to be with God and to love him. So the starting point is desire. It is to intentionally, intentionally, consciously plan your life, your time, your thought process around God. A rule of life guides us into that surrender and obedience to experience home life resurrected. I want to give you some opportunities for how to dive into creating a rule of life this week. Do you remember those books? Uh, maybe you read them to your kids or you're reading them to your kids now and they're so fun because they, they have what you call an alternate ending. You read to a certain point and then there are options. If you flip to this page, this will happen. If you flip to that page, we are gonna try something. It's an experiment, it might not work. But our experiment is an alternate ending to this message, a rule of, rule of life for your stage of life. Um, we're going to give you some five-minute videos that will be available after this video um, on our Facebook page. It'll be av available on our YouTube page. And, and you can go through these rules of life, you, literally week by re week. You can write a how you will guide your life, how you will lead yourself spiritually. That's this week's challenge. And so we're going to have a video for teens. We're going to have a video for singles. We're going to have a video for parents. You get the point. We're going to have some videos. They're short, but will help you begin to think through writing a stage of life. And then later this week on, on um, YouTube and Facebook, I'm going to make available a short teaching that will guide us through literally writing our own personalized action plan for a rule of life. So, you're going to have several opportunities to respond to now. But before we do that, I want to remind you of this truth. We're tempted to believe that the cat is away when we aren't in our spiritual community. But I believe God has allowed us to come back to our homes because he wants Christ to be the center and he wants us to come to the altar and bring our idols and he wants them to be removed. He wants to be magnified in our life. 
So will you join me in this process? Will you choose an alternate ending? And will you begin to work on a rule of life with me? Let me pray for you. Jesus, as we end this time, would you guide us in the direction you need us to go? Would you give us the courage to continue on in Holy Spirit? Would you protect our congregation and bring us the healing we need and Lord, um, bring us back together in the right time. But while we're apart, would you teach us how to live for you out here scattered into the world? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Check out your alternate ending and we'll see you next week. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling.